I'm, I'm sweating just walking. I am too. I am too. I live in the high desert. I've lived there for many, many years. But Dave doesn't like the desert, so I don't think he's going to be a happy camper. This place sucks, man. I don't even know why anybody want to drive across it. Whatever. This is my kind of survival. Put me in a swamp, put me in a jungle, put me in a forest. That's where I want to be. Water is a big word to me. Water's my favorite word. This vast, dried up salt lake is in the middle of a desert on Mexico's Baja Peninsula. Because this is a salt flat, it's super punishing, even for me. Its high saline content prohibits virtually all life from plants and animals to microorganisms. And look at this stuff. Even if it rained out here, we're still because it's gonna fall down here, dissolve all this salt, and it's basically like drinking ocean water plus. You know, you've been to a salt flat before? No. Dave Canterbury has 20 years of military and wilderness training, but if there's one place he avoids, it's the desert. You know, I've never been to a salt flat before, and this place is like devastating to me. This ain't Ohio, so this white stuff is all salt. Man. That's the sodium, yeah. His partner, Cody Lundeen, is one of America's top desert survival trainers. I've been through lots of salt flats, and I know that people that get stuck in them typically die, unless it's a third party rescue. There's no resources for survival out here unless you brought them with you. Cody and Dave will show what it takes to survive a breakdown using only what a typical off road biker would have with him. It's like we have a motorcycle care package up here, a helmet. Might be a good container at some point. A tarp. It's like we have some desert shelter. It's like probably a motorcycle cover. Goggles. A plastic bag. A newspaper. A can of soda. You don't hydrate with soda pop. It's full of sugar. And a jug of the most vital desert resource. Ooh. Agua. But not enough of it. This isn't hardly anything as far as water in the situation. You can sweat four quarts an hour out here, and we have two-thirds of a quart of water between two full-grown men. That lid good and tight, man? As tight as these cheap milk jugs can be, you know? Self-rescue is the key to this game, but the whole time you're losing water, and all of a sudden you start going into heavy-duty signs of dehydration and hypothermia. Hyperthermia occurs when the body exceeds 100 degrees, triggering vital organs to begin shutting down. My main thing is to get our bodies out of this sun right now. I'm not seeing a whole lot of options. What I have right now, my main thing for survival in this arid, dry environment is what I'm wearing. It's my clothing. Just simple clothing keeps you shaded from the sun and it has your sweat evaporate at a much less accelerated rate. Loose clothing creates a layer of insulating air, trapping sweat, slowing dehydration, and cooling the body. Any water I do lose, I'm gonna to try to recycle it back. It's a water game out here. And the only water I see right now is in this body. You look like some kind of goat herder. <laughs> it's basic desert survival stuff. Here, let me see your hat, I'll do you a favor. You want me to on your rag, too? I know I don't want you on my rag. You don't want me to on that, too? I don't want you on my hat, brother. It don't need to be on. I'm doing you a favor. You don't want me to on your hat? No, I really don't, tell you the truth. You don't know what you're missing. Oh, I know what I'm missing. Smelling your urine for the next three hours. Right now, the only water out here, you're looking at it. This is Cody water and that's all I have. Now I can wring off some of this into your hat. You're sure though, right? I'm positive, brother. Okay. What are friends for? There's a lot of capillary beds close to the skin in the scalp, and that's where 50% of heat gain can happen in a desert survival situation like this. This is water near my skin. My head is cold. Do I want to wrap something around my face that I just in and smell that? What is the give and take of that, OK? Yeah, my head gets cool, and now I puke my guts out. So I just lost all the hydration I had in my body just trying to cool my head down? No thanks. It doesn't smell. Smell it. No thanks, brother. Psychological disgust has killed a lot of people. I have a lot more experience than Dave in desert stuff, and he can choose to use that experience or not. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't always make it drink. Bottom line is I'm living, and if he wants to tag along, that's cool. 
dude, when I start on something I wrap around my body, it's time to get out of this place. You know what I'm, I'm ready when you are, man. Have you picked a direction? Yeah, the direction is pretty much gonna be that way. Rock and roll. A mountain range is the best shot at a new ecosystem and a chance at water. Our objective is to head to that saddle because it seems to be the closest thing to get off of the salt flat. But with no trees for scale, distance is impossible to gauge. We see what looks like it's more resources in the distance, like to see mountains. They look like they're right over there, but right over there could be 20 kilometers for all I know. Desert hiking means accounting for the rule of thirds. Something that appears to be five miles away is really three times further. Look at the dust devils blowing out over there. Yeah. Tucked between two mountain ranges, the salt flat can become a fierce wind tunnel, clocking hot air and sand gusts up to 100 miles per hour. This wind is out of control. You're getting sand blown in my eyeballs. The salt flat it changes all the time. It goes from dead calm, all of a sudden you got 30, 40 knot winds out here. Well, look at you. I believe you called me a goat herder. So what is this, the Star Wars look? This is uh, keeping the dust out of your mouth look. The wind's picking up now. Get my ear, my mouth. The total pain in the ass. Wind not only makes walking less efficient, it evaporates sweat causing the body to produce more. This breeze, it's pulling water from our body a lot faster than if it wasn't here. So we've got to get out of this area with no cover. What we want is shelter and water, shelter and water, and more shelter and water. So which one do you want to pick? Let's try this one. Let's see if we can just pop it over this. So there's our shade pocket. You can see right here. So basically, sun comes out. We're just going to hang out as best we can. You know, it is what it is. So the bottom line is we agreed to wait until dark, correct? In the desert, it's good to travel at night because you alleviate all that heat problem and sun and dehydration that you've got to worry about. Let's just stick out here and tell really bad jokes and wait till it gets cooler. Sit here and wait it out. OK. Look off the distance, you can see mountains, but hell, can be 20 miles away for all we yeah. know. So we'll start walking this thing at night, and we'll see if we get there by morning. sun's going down behind the mountains over here, so. We should start kicking it now. What do you think? Yeah. Walking at night in the Baja Desert can be disorienting and dangerous. It calls for a good light source and steady visual bearing. We've got a full moon phase right now, which is going to light this place up like early morning dawn all night long. The saddle is perfectly illumined by the moon. And as long as Dave and I follow the saddle silhouette, we're on the road to better hunting grounds. Even if the moon is hidden, usually the stars are out. And here's my friend Polaris. I know you know all about celestial navigation by you know, the North Star. And I was going to show you this trick an old Marine buddy of mine taught me how to navigate if you can't see the North Star for some reason. Yeah, lay it on me. Turn this light on for a minute. You know, the fact of the matter is that if you navigate by the North Star and the North Star alone, sometimes you can be hosed because there can be cloud cover that the North Star is not visible. But there's, you know, thousands and thousands of other stars out there. So what you do is find any star except the North Star, because the North Star is stationary in the sky. That's why you use it for navigation. All the other stars move throughout the night. You just take a stick that's got a fork in it, almost like a gun sight. And I've got one that's fairly sharp. I'm just going to put one stick in the ground. And I'm going to take the other stick, and I'm going to put it behind it. And I want to adjust it to where when I look at that, it's like a gun sight. And I'm looking through the V to that star. 
So what, the star's right in the crotch? Right, there? exactly. And what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna sit here, you know, for a few minutes, long enough for the star to move. And the way this works is, if you have a regular compass, it goes north, east, south, and west. And I just write the word lured underneath it. And then if I wait 15 or 20 minutes and I look back at my gun sight again, if my star has moved left, then I'm facing north. If my star moved left and up, then I'm facing northeast. If my star moved right and up, I'm facing southeast. Right and down, southwest, just correlates to these letters. Wow, that's trippy. It's just uh, another skill to put into the belt, you know, and you can't have too many of those. You ready to split then? Yeah, man, let's rock, bro. Let's do it. You know, the only thing I'm worried about out here at night, that is the more we move and the more we talk like I'm doing right now, the more I'm losing my hydration. In normal conditions, the body produces about a liter of saliva a day. And like sweat, every drop lost to evaporation has to be replaced. What is that reflection? Look at that, Dave. Cap that light on. Water in the middle of nowhere. What do you think about all that? I think it's great. I wish we could drink it. Water that falls on a salt bed starts to absorb saline immediately, making the water undrinkable. We just found a whole boatload of water here in the salt flats, but it's full of sodium, so we really can't do anything with it now. Normal body saline is less than 1%. This is at least 2, 2.5, in my mind. Human kidneys can't process any more salt, creating a toxic buildup in the blood, sucking hydration from the body's cells. If we drank this stuff, we'd dehydrate literally from the inside out. So we're both going to play the violin and walk away because the sodium in this is high enough, it's not worth it. But out here, even undrinkable water could be a sign of a new ecosystem. Maybe we're approaching the other edge of the range, or maybe monkeys are going to flatter my at any moment. And we're just happen to be in the middle of the salt flat. There's water here, God knows why, but we can't use it, so we got to motor on. High and dry? You ready to rock, man? Yeah. But there's no telling if the mountain is five miles away or 15. Getting to the mountain's resources by dawn means keeping a straight path. I was just thinking something kind of funny is the fact that you're right-handed and I'm left-handed. I just wa almost walked into you right there. Keeps us from experiencing lateral drift. Research has shown that hikers without a visual bearing or compass drift to one side over time, possibly because they favor a dominant leg. They tend to step heavier on that foot, and eventually they walk in circles. I'm going to continually walk into you because I'm left-handed, and you're going to continually walk toward me because you're right-handed, and we're going to keep each other straight. It's like Laverne and Shirley. <laughs> exactly. Who do you want to be? I want you to be Shirley so I can <laughs> fantasize. <laughs> Shlemiel, Shlemazel. I know Dave hates the desert with a passion, but I think he's digging desert night walking. And he'll hate it again tomorrow. Less than an hour before dawn, temperatures are already on the rise, triggering sweating and more loss of fluids. I'm seeing green, man. What do you think? That looks like a good sign to me, man. Anything green out here besides a dollar bill is a good sign. It almost makes me want to weep, but I'm not gonna because I'd lose water. And this, this is my friend, Salt Cedar. This is like shaking hands with a friend to me, man. So it's a good sign. Let's boogie on. The salt flats of northern Mexico are surrounded by mountain desert. Vegetation indicates the possibility of water, but conifers like the salt cedar don't need much to survive. You know, slowly we made our way out of the salt flat, came upon some different terrain, scrubby stuff, then the junipers and the pinions, and a pretty much clear up here into the pine oak forest at this point in time. Let's walk up this flood zone right yeah. through here. 
I mean, I'm looking at this wash, I'm looking at all the flood debris, and look at these stains from water lines when this used to be in its heyday. It seems like it's getting more intense as far as potential water. So this looks pretty good, Dave. This place is pretty choked with willows. Willows are leafy, deciduous trees that require abundant groundwater to survive. From what I'm seeing now, there's no water. In the desert, a freshwater source is often hidden. Arid mountain earth quickly absorbs any rainwater, forming a grid of underground streams or arroyos. I live in arroyo country. Uh, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles of arroyos all throughout the Southwest. The trick is finding them. Yeah, it does seem pretty wet. We came up over that little draw and it's very, very moist on the surface there. 75,000 nerve endings make the bare foot hypersensitive to the slightest moisture. There's no guarantee, but I think it's worth doing a pilot hole in here. This is what the coyotes do. So if you see any dig holes, coyotes have a lot better sniffers than we do. So I follow them a lot in the desert. I follow their lead. There's no guarantees in a desert that there's going to be water where you go. It doesn't matter what the vegetation looks like. It doesn't mean anything in the desert. There can be places you think there's water, and there's nothing. So we're down what? At least about 16 inches now? And it's still going. In the increasing morning heat, every move is a loss of valuable fluids. How far would you dig down before you say? And this could be the first of many digs in order to find water in the hot, barren desert. The risk of dehydration out here is very high. I'm just hoping we can find some water we can drink. Oh, boy. Bingo. There's water. Look at that. There's a few inches of standing water down there. Just don't collapse it. I'm going to dig it a little bit more. But if I take this and soak some of that up, what's it We finally arrived at what we thought was an area that there would be a water source. And Cody sees an area of wet ground and starts digging like a gopher in there, and all of a sudden, whack, we got a spring of water. This is just like huge, huge score. A huge score. Now, as far as disinfecting this water, I'm looking at a sand filter as far as I can see. Yeah, I and would this drink place it. is out in the middle of nowhere. I would drink it. I just drank it out of my scarf. So I, I feel pretty good about that in this location. I think we should find some place that'll work as a base camp. I don't think there's any reason we need to be more than 100 yards away from this water source. Yeah, I agree with that. Let's do it, man. overcast skies today. It's pretty windy, and it's quite a bit colder than it was yesterday. So we're going to have to fight that today. I think we need to make a game plan for today. Maybe I can soup this shelter area up, make this perform a little bit better. I'd like to investigate that beach for a signal fire area. We'll divide and conquer this whole thing, man. That's all we can do. The most important skill in wilderness survival working with what you've got. You know, as I'm walking through here, there's several things that I'm looking for. I'm looking for shell, I'm looking for stone. All of those things can make tools. All of those things can make things that we can utilize. You're a constant scavenger. You know, I'm gonna be like a junkyard dog. Obviously, we're by the ocean. There's some sea life here. Dead mollusks, like clams and mussels, are likely to be infected with bacteria. And it smells like crap. But a good survivalist can find a use for anything. I can use that later on for bait, carry that out, and make my traps. Any predators that are around are going to be attracted by this. I'm a self-preservation type guy. You know, I'm not going to walk through here and not look for usable resources. But my main goal out here is to get a signal fire built. A signal fire may be a shipwreck survivor's only chance at rescue. But with open water surrounding the island, the fire needs to catch attention from air and sea. OK. This is a perfect spot for my signal fire. I got wide open shipping lane right here. I got lots of resources over here. And this is the highest point out here for that. This is the spot. I got to go get some dry wood. A burning ember will need to be transferred from camp. But sparking this signal fire will require something more combustible 
than dry logs. Hey, that's exactly what I'm looking for right there. This is a birch bark tree. This stuff goes up in flames like gasoline. It has a lot of oils in it. I'm gonna need a good fresh piece of this. It's easier for me just to cut it right off the tree, fresh and live, and not wait for it to peel off itself naturally. Cody would not like this, but it'll be a bigger piece. Other stuff is the best fire tender you can possibly find in boreal forest areas like this. Dissipating clouds will release the warm ground level air, which will drop temperatures even more once the sun sets. Dave's doing his thing and I'm doing my thing. My thing is to make this a better place to be. I want to revamp this shelter using basic physics and make it 10 times more efficient. If I can make this shelter 75, 80 degrees and use one-tenth of the wood, that's a huge survival savings. So I'm gonna take that plastic that I got from the boat and try to make a bubble like a greenhouse here. The long wave radiation from the fire will go through the plastic and heat up the inside of this lean-to. And as I do that, I'll have a space blanket, that mylar shiny blanket on the underside of this, which will reflect the long wave radiation onto us, and it'll be trapped within a bubble of plastic. Developed by NASA, aluminized mylar reflects up to 97% of solar radiation. It's used to protect the International Space Station from the sun. I need to somehow figure out how to put a space blanket behind me, and I'm not sure how to do that. I know what I want to do, I just don't know how to do it yet. The improved shelter will use less firewood and stay warmer, if it works. And it, even though putting up this damn space blanket, it's like, I mean, where do they hire these people to fold this thing? I mean, look at how many folds are in this thing. Oh, what am I gonna do? Now, I'm trying to find the exact location we came in on the raft so that I could scavenge off of that raft any usable equipment that we've got left on. It's basic survival code to never destroy a means of escape. I want to leave this raft as totally intact as I can right now. But what's attached to it can be even more useful. There are some baffles on the bottom of this boat that we can definitely use for containers. You know, there's a lot of rope on here. I'm gonna take all this rope with me. Um, I can actually carve one into this broken paddle off and make it into a point and fire harden it. And I can spear a raccoon, a skunk, a possum. You know, there's a lot of animals out here, small woodland type animals that are edible animals. The two most important things that people need to understand in a situation like this, you have to maintain body's core temperature and hydration. Without either one of those, you will die. Got a pond here. It's got cattails growing everywhere. That's a good sign that this water's fresh. Snow is 90% air and 10% water. Ice is 90% water and 10% air. That's why I want ice. I'm just sliding around. This ain't safe. Getting into some good stuff here. I see bubbles right here. I want to make sure there's no salt in it. It doesn't taste like salt at all. It tastes better than bottled water. How you been, man? Been doing. What you got in the bag? Where'd you get the bag? Got the bag off of the uh, boat there. I cut the ballast off the bottom, put some ice in there. Sweet. Talk to me about this shelter, man. I mean, you got a Lakota sweat lodge, bush hippie party house going on in here. Let's explain it's this a, to it's me. It's a fun house that's gonna use like maybe one eighth of the wood. It is what it is, man. I mean, I don't understand why anybody would drape plastic over their shelter in front of their fire. You know, if your fire gets too big, obviously it's gonna melt that thing away. It's just not the way that I'm used to doing things. You've gotta come all the way out of that shelter now to put wood on the fire. Right. So is that a shift to shift shelter? Or two people gonna snooze in there and we one guy's both. just gonna have to get up? No, both. And you're gonna be toasty in there, okay? I don't know if you quite read between the lines about what I really did. There was some hardcore physics that were going on there. I'll see you 
in a bit then. I'd offer you my pants and boots, but I know you'd turn it down. I'm going to so. turn it down. Yeah, you know that. OK. I'm going to liberate Dave's mind tonight. When he goes in that shelter, I'm going to put too much wood on it, and I'm going to burn his shorts off his body. Calories are hard to come by in a situation like this. And this is a big calorie game. Whether it's the wood on the fire or the food in the body, it's still fuel. In extreme cases of malnutrition, the body begins a process called catabolysis and breaks down its own fat and muscle tissue to stay alive. I would like to check out the coastline and see if I can get some slow-moving protein. Maybe there's some mussels, maybe there's clams, maybe there's crabs. So right off the bat, here's what I'm looking for. This little place here, there's a breathing hole here, there's one here, and I'm gonna just dig. It's low tide, so the water's out. Digging sticks were used cross-culturally for thousands of years, so this simple stick doesn't require any energy to make it, but look how more efficient it is than my hands. Sometimes these clams can be fairly deep. Just because there's an indicator doesn't mean there's supper there. Here's what we're after. There's a live clam. To me, these are easy calories to catch. All you need to do is gather them. This can be eaten raw, just as is. Right out of there. Comes in its own salt brine. This is rockweed. It is edible. It's not pizza, for sure, but it's something to eat. I happen to know this rockweed, but if I don't know what it is, I don't eat it, because if you're sick out here, it compounds the problem incredibly. Like a hunting gathering person, I'm grazing as I'm going and just eating on the fly. Calories, these calories don't run. These are periwinkles. They're just literally all over this little beach. Even though a single periwinkle has minimal meat, the sedentary snails form in dense clusters along shorelines. It's all a calorie game. When you bring back something, you've made that energy you've spent worth it. Yeah! I've seen plenty of tracks. There's some stuff out here. Dave's survival strategy stands in opposition to Cody's gatherer philosophy. I hunt all seasons. I hunt all types of game. I hunt with all types of weapons, from primitive weapons to modern weapons to homemade fashioned weapons. I have to do what I have to do to fight Mother Nature, because Mother Nature is unforgiving. She doesn't let you survive. If you just laid here half naked like Cody does, you don't survive. Burning through calories to track game is a gamble. If it takes more energy to find food than it provides, it's a losing one. OK, now we've got a set of tracks right here. We know what animals are in this area. There's probably porcupines. We know there's squirrels. So we can, by process of elimination, we can tell these are small tracks. Most likely, this is a squirrel. But the good thing about this is it's telling us there's small game in this area. I want to do some trapping. I want to find something to bring back to the table for Cody. OK. This is a good spot right here for our deadfall. I can see some tracks back in here. I know that there's squirrel in here, and there's rabbits. I know there's raccoon in here. You know, this is a real simplistic trap. I have these nasty old clams in my back pocket. We'll just break that nasty thing up and put them on the end of this skewer for bait. Oh, yeah. Put my bait stick in here, back my deadfall up in there. A deadfall trap consists of a heavy log and a baited trigger. The idea is to get that thing just barely pivoting on this trap. The log needs to be five times the weight of the prey to work. So all he has to do is move it. It's not going to kill a 20-pound raccoon, but it will kill a small weasel, a marten, a squirrel, something like that that comes in here just nibbling around. It's winter. The animals right now are scavenging for food everywhere. I got to set at least six to eight more if it's going to produce anything for us in the next few days for me.
hippopotamus attacks are not fairy tales, they're facts. They're a 4,000 pound freight train with foot and a half long teeth. Dave, there's something up here in the grass. It's a pack. Cody and Dave are taking on the role of two fishermen stranded in the Delta after a hippo attack destroys their boat. We should beat it, huh? We can go through this thing later. If there's yeah, man, there. where's the closest dry land at look like you? We need to get to dry land, somewhere that we can find some resources, get a high point for navigational purposes, and assess what's in this backpack. That's the biggest, closest tree. What's that there, then? Any crocs and hippos in here to mess around? I'll tell you, in this low spot with all this vegetation, man, it's easy to get turned around. Naturalist Cody Lundin adopted a primitive survival style in the Arizona desert. The Okavango Delta is one of the biggest wetlands on planet Earth. That's a pretty different cup of coffee from where I'm from, from Arizona. Do you think this is crocodile turf right where we are right now? I mean, a 12-foot crocodile can hide in about 10 inches of water sometimes. I don't know what the Okavango Delta is gonna hold for Cody Lundin, but the fact of the matter is, Arizona, baby. Dave Canterbury has an edge on this four million acre floodplain. After serving in the US Army, he spent three years in the Florida Everglades wrangling reptiles. You know, I love the Okavanga Delta because it's a huge giant swamp and I'm in a swamp rat. Just watch for grass moving in front of you, bro. Dave has a lot more swamp experience than I do, but he's never been to Botswana. And none of the swamps he's been to have hippopotamus. This is a new swamp for both of us. Just after dawn, hippos head back to the water, seeking protection from the sun's rays. The best time to get across Hippo Island safely is now. Whoa! Look at that guy. I almost tripped over him. Wow. Pretty cool, isn't it? Just like an MRE. That's a meal ready to eat. When I go out into the bush, one of the things I like to bring is a bagel with peanut butter and honey. So I have my glucose, my carbohydrate, and my fat with some trace proteins as well. So I'd have to work on it for my imagination, but I guess this tortoise kind of looks like a big ass bagel. This animal's alive, and live food never spoils. We don't have to eat it now, we can eat it whenever we want to. We can keep it alive and eat it at our leisure. Just like an MRE. You know what I mean? So we'll just slide him down in here. So he's not upside down, that's the only thing they really don't like. And we'll make sure we keep the backpack out of direct sun, and he'll be fine. This is a lot different here. It looks like this island's a lot bigger than we originally thought. When we're on, it looks like flat out African savanna. Battery's about shouting this thing, but it looks like it's saying we go straight that way, man. Looks like clear sailing as far as we know. That's gonna put us further down the trail, and that's what we need to do to head back to that camp on that GPS. The next thing we need to talk about is our boxed lunch over here. Yeah, go ahead and kill the tortoise. I'll go grab some firewood, and you deal with the tortoise. This is a survival situation, so if you get any meat value at all where you can get some protein in your body, take advantage of it. Okay, see you in a bit. All right. All right, time to kill a tortoise. I've checked this area really good for predators, but anytime you draw blood on something or you gut something, you never want to do it around your camp if there's predators even possibly in the area. All right, buddy, last dance. My plan is to let this tortoise start to walk away, which means he's going to stick his neck completely out. When he does that, I'll be able to cut his head off clean. One quick slice, he's dead. This is all nervous reaction, and he's done. And now we're gonna pit bake him. Pit baking is a simple way to slow cook meat a practice used by cultures around the globe for thousands of years. Now what we need to do is put our tortoise in the hole upside down, just like this. I'm gonna bury on top of them like this. Put all this dirt around them, just like this, real quick-like. And then I'm gonna move the fire right over the top of them. 
Tomorrow morning, we should have a pretty tasty breakfast on our hands. Where do you want this wood? Put some of it in the fire if you want to, man. I got that thing down to a bed of coals now. Is the tortoise in there? Yeah, he's in the pit. Well, I'm hearing calls from over there. I'm hearing calls from over there. I heard I'm just calls. like. I heard the hippos. I wonder if I can find our breakfast, Cody. Where the hell did you put it? Yeah, I think this is him right here, man. I pit baked this tortoise last night, and I have no idea what I'm going to get into when I dig it up. This shell's breaking pretty clean. Look at that, man. What the hell is that? That's the meat and the guts. I see guts. Where's the meat? Right there. That's the spine. See that spine? That's all back meat. Yeah, I don't mess with tortoises and turtles in my country because I don't think they're worth it, and they really smell. So what the hell is that thing that looks like a half a pink donut? Probably his liver and his stomach. Is that an anus, or is that the... I don't know. That's some sort of orifice. Here's some meat, Cody. Oh, here's the... Here's the thigh. Here's the greens. This is... This is stomach contents. I've never eaten stomach contents of a tortoise before, but I was hoping for something more. Look at that chunk of meat right there, Cody. You sure that's meat? It looks like a penis. I don't know tortoise physiology at all, and I think I saw a duodenum, and I think I saw the penis. Dude, that's meat for sure right there. I mean, that right there might be a piece of pie. I think that's a penis. That might be a penis. That's all right. Tortoise penis. <clears throat> now I just stole his manhood. I witnessed Davey the tortoise penis, so maybe that can be my new nickname for him. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Yeah. This is ugly, brother, right here. Yeah, it is. The only limits to the vast Arizona desert are canyons, a daunting challenge for even trained survivalists. You know, for anyone caught in this situation, it's bad news. Minimal food, minimal water, all of a sudden, you have extremely technical country. It's just not good. So I do see some water over there. There's one, two, three, maybe four pools. <laughs> wow. I know. That's... It's down there. Canyons are formed by erosion, literally carved into the earth by fast-moving river waters. In this scenario, the most important resource for survival is 2,000 feet straight down. I want that water, but getting down in there, you know, we might be committed. Then there's the chance of falling. Yeah, let me just cut through all the smoke-filled coffee house crap for you real fast and dummy this down, OK? In a survival situation, especially in a desert, your priority is water, all right? There's water right there. One way or another, that water's going to be in my mouth in the next two hours. Water's water. And I think that, you know, this is one obstacle we're just going to have to find a way into. Be merciful on me. This rock is sharper than hell. I want my psychology up peak 110%, and that's through proper hydration. How does it look? It looks like we're stepping down just like what was behind us. It looks like a series of drops. Anyone in this situation who's low on water or low on food and low on energy, slightly dehydrated, etc., you're going to have even less mojo in your head to move through rough terrain like this. This sucks, man because I'm barefoot, I have to really watch where I'm putting my feet, and so does he with the shifting rocks. Look, Cody, water. Yep, that's the stuff. Oh, man, let's get down there. This is pretty rank-looking water, dude. It's got insect larvae. Yeah, well, it won't make me real happy. I'm not drinking out of something like this. That's how it is. You would drink this crap? Well, hell yes, I'd drink that. This water is skanky, nasty, filthy. There's larva floating around there. We're going to have to filter it somehow. There's no option to disinfect that water. You get the insect larva. That's protein. This is like a crystal spring compared to some of the stuff I've drank out here. This is nasty, man. I'm not getting this whole thing with Cody. 
Cody looked at this water and he's like, oh, it's an oasis. Like we should just be down there troughing on it like a couple puppy dogs in the water bowl. That's kind of where I draw the line. I'm gonna be drinking here real soon with or without you. Dave comes from a state that has water oozing out of every rock in the county, it seems like. And you take what you can get out here. It's not a mirage, it's not a dream. This is life itself out here, drop by drop. Now, this looks a lot better to me down here, Cody. Yeah, you have no choice. I'm gonna drink this. We're gonna drink it and take our chances and not disinfect it. Before we leave these pools, I want our bodies full and this thing full, topped up, okay? Drinking water without boiling it could end in vomiting and diarrhea, leading to dehydration. But every risk is a calculated one. If I worked on this last night and I have this entire thing burned out, and now we have a semi-permanent device to carry water beyond what our bodies can hold. And out here, that's your life. If this is last water, I did agree. you do your thing? Yeah, I'm good. OK. Fully hydrating before leaving any terrain is the best survival strategy, especially when what's ahead is one of the harshest environments in Arizona. This canyon is going to spit out in the lower Sonoran Desert. We're not going to have the microclimate, the coolness of this canyon. We're not going to have the shade. We're probably not going to have any more water like this. You know, Dave probably doesn't know it, but this is a paradise in here. When traveling in the extreme Sonoran desert heat, the body burns energy to keep its core temperature at a survivable level, calories that must be replaced. In a survival situation, depending on how long you have gone without food, depends on the risk of reward of what you go after to eat. And if you've went three or four days without eating anything, I think just about anything you can find, you're going to eat. Cody, there's a snake up here. Uh-oh. This is a Mojave Rattler. What do you think about eating snake? He's getting mad. I used to hunt snakes for a living, and I could spot snakes from a long ways away. So I've been looking hard for them. Approaching a snake from the side is the best way to prevent a strike. But an S-shaped coil is a sign that the snake is about to attack. Hey, Cody, watch him. He's coming yep. to the other side. Where is he? Coming out. He's coming yep. to the other side, man. Hey, Cody, watch him. He's coming your way. Uh, Get him, man. Yeah, I got it. We're talking chow. Chow, OK. Why don't we just find a place where, yeah, where I can cross? Yeah, out right now. Can you find us a yep, place to yeah, get in the shade? Yeah. OK. Yeah, he's done. He's not going anywhere. I've got a perfectly good knife right here, but Cody wants to use his rock to skin it with and do the caveman thing, and I'm cool with that. So Cody's going to skin it out, and uh, we're going to cook this bad boy up, and we're going to have us a little bit of a feast. Hey, Dave, can you take care of that for me? Yeah, man. That bad boy right in the fire. The head of a rattlesnake is dangerous long after the thing is dead. So if you were to just nick yourself on one of these fangs, you can still be venomated by the snake, even though it's dead. What I do when I skin a snake, I tie it up. I borrowed a piece of Dave's parachute cord, tie it up to a tree, and I skin it. I run, in this case, this basalt knife down the actual snake because I want to save the skin. And then I'll open it up and I'll gut it just like any other critter. So Dave, as you're my official partner, and I officially live in this state, I'm bequeathing you this Mojave skin well, to, to do that, with man. as you will. That's very cool, man. Thanks, dude. Congratulations, cool. Snake Wrangler. Yeah. I appreciate that, Cody. This was your kill, man. It's only because you didn't. You're the one that found it. You know, we have the snake, and that's a, a huge thing psychologically and physiologically for Dave and myself. And it's a little bit later in the day, which means it's cooler, which is nice. but. You know, this needs to end. This situation, anyone in this situation can't be out here eating snake. You know, they have to get rescued sooner or later, or you're not going to make it. The way out of this wetland is to have something that floats. It's a lot of work up front, but if I put myself into a Guato mindset, I think it will get easier. A thinking person would say, screw your dugout canoe, just make a raft dude and huck fin it down the river. Well, that thinking person isn't in Cayman, piranha-infested anaconda territory. 
I don't want my ass dangling in water going down a stream where I'm on the menu. So you can see, even with this machete, I've got a pretty serious divot here already. I've been chopping for about 30 seconds to a minute, and I already have a large section of this removed. It's a lot of work, it's a huge commitment of calories, but it's, it's doable. And you can see from this that it's actually making progress fairly quickly. The most tedious part of this is the initial start. In fire later on, we'll do the majority of the work after that. I'm gonna see if I can find an arrow shaft. Okay, here's a stand of bamboo right here. And this is pretty much what I'm looking for for arrow material. I wanna find something pretty small in diameter, maybe a little bit bigger than a pencil. Once the bamboo is cleared, it's split four ways and sharpened to create a four-pronged fishing gig. I need a stick and slide it in between the first two. And then I'm gonna break another stick and slide it down between the other two and tie that split in place. What I have when I'm done with that is basically a four-tine gig point with four spear points on it. That's an arrow that I can shoot at fish. Most of the machete work is done. I have a lot of experience using fire as a tool to hollow out concavities. I'm simply adding coals from the fire into the holes, and the fire will now do most of the work. It doesn't require a lot of physical labor on my part, but I think probably the way I look speaks for itself. Um, it's a lot of work. These shady areas around the bank right here are the exact areas that fish will be laying in, you know, thinking they're safe. Where'd you go, buddy? There it is. This is perfect. on this canoe forces us to gather food because it's gonna take a lot of caloric intake to make sure that we can get this canoe done. A high energy food source like piranha is key to any survival mission. A single fish can contain over 30 grams of protein, an immediate injection of energy. There's one over here in the shade. There it is. There you go. All right, this is what I'm talking about. Now we got some fish, we got some meat, we're ready to go. Now, Cody's canoe idea is looking a little better to me, but I gotta see if there's any more in here. That's two. Look at the teeth on that thing. That's why these things are so fierce. With a long day of hollowing out the canoe ahead, Cody addresses the next survival priority disinfecting water. Water disinfects over time via heat, so I don't need to boil this water. Boiling it could destroy the plastic bottle, but pasteurization is possible and just as effective. We should be able to have this water reach temperature to destroy all harmful waterborne pathogens while still having the container to drink out of for at least a time or two or three. Slowly heating water to 160 degrees for about 40 minutes will make it safe to drink. It's work, okay, but it's also work puking your guts out, crapping your pants. Hey, brother. Look at you. A couple piranha there. Look at the teeth on those yeah, things. Yeah, pull that lip back, man. They're nasty. Ugly. Look at that thing. Damn. They're nasty. I've never seen anything like that. Got yeah, a fire. Gotta fire them up, man. Sweet. So I'm gonna drop my pack and I'm gonna go cut a few poles for the shelter because we gotta get on that too. Sounds good. All right. If you look real close at these fish, 
That's what you're dealing with. This thing is just made to rip chunks of meat off. I'm glad I'm ripping chunks of meat off of it. Piranha are not the Pantanal's only deadly predators. Jaguars hunt this area after dark. Staying overnight requires a shelter that will protect against a surprise attack. What I need to do now is start building the basic structure of this debris hut. It's fairly simple, fairly quick. I'm turning all these palm fronds so that the channels are up on the leaves. That'll channel any water if it does rain right off the shelter. I need to pile debris on the shelter, about three or four inches thick. If predators are going to come into this camp, like jaguars, I want them to come facing me where I can see them coming. This gives us a frontal attack advantage. We can put a fire out here to keep them at bay. Check it out. They're both done. Bounce, huh? Look at that. Yeah. That's a lot of meat on a fish of this size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They come with their own built-in toothpicks. I'm just going to sit on my ass here and eat. All right, man. I'll be right back. some fish, so we got the calorie gain pretty well whipped. Mm -hmm. And uh, water, got fire, and we got shelter. We're working on our transportation. We'll know real quick if that boat's going to pay off or not. The more I think I know about my craft of primitive technology, the more inept I feel. You know, it's just, it's a humbling thing. To take on a project like that, that big, yeah, it, it's tough. You know, this canoe is a big commitment, and to say that I'm happy about it right now would be a lie, but we've made a decision together as a team to work on this canoe. And I hope that sucker works, man. Dual survivals, art of self-reliance. The problem with fishing with a bow is refraction of light off the water. Refraction is the bending of light that occurs when it enters water, creating an optical illusion. The fish is actually in a different spot than you think he is when you're looking at it, and you have to compensate for that with your aim. So you have to aim lower than you think you're going to shoot the fish, or you'll miss him. You'll shoot over top of him. There you go. Brazil's Pantanal waterways are a super highway for finding civilization. But in one of the most dangerous swamps on the planet, traveling down this river requires one thing a vessel that keeps the entire body out of the dangerous waters. This is a hardwood log right here, buddy. Dave and Cody have spent two days doing as the natives did for centuries, building a fire-burned canoe. Dave and I agreed up front that we were doing the work together. I'm going to burn. He's going to do some chopping. We're kind of working on this thing from the inside out and from the outside in to get the shape that we want. We can burn this log out all day long and make a great big punch bowl out of it, but it's going to roll over in the water. you got to make this thing look like a boat for it to act like a boat. Anybody that's ever tried to stand up on a floating log knows all it does is roll in circles. It's not going to matter where it's got a hole burned in the middle of it or not. It has to have a bow and a stern cut into it. We're going to have to carve the front like a shovel nose down at an angle this way. And we'll have to keep the sides straight like they are. And then I'll have to start working on the back and do virtually the same thing, just a little shallower angle. Here in the parent at all, it's still hot. I'm still wet with sweat. As you can see, this log's still smoldering on the inside. So it's still very, very hot right here. And we're dehydrating constantly. Intense physical activity can suck liters of hydration from the body each day. You know, I'm only gonna get so much time out of that to disinfect water. And I wanna be able to try to develop some sort of container to hold water when that plastic bottle fails. This is an Akuri palm here. I want to try to get that seed pot, because I can use that as a container. And that is one hell of a seed pod. 
A single akuri pod contains thousands of seeds for new palm trees. <sighs> Looks like I'm giving birth. The watertight shell protects them from predators until they're ready to germinate. <sighs> it's very rare to have an indigenous waterproof container right off the bat. You know, right now, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find some food. And what I'm looking for is to see if there's any peccary in this area. They're a fairly large pig. It would be a lot bigger meal for Cody and I than these small piranha that we're catching now. <laughs> right now, this is what I did not want to find. This is the jaguar track. And jaguars are dangerous animals. They're known man eaters. They're definitely at the top of the food chain in this area of the Pantanal. You can see that track engulfs my hand completely. That is a 300-pound man-eating freaking monster the size of a tiger. This track being here means that I need to look at camp security a whole lot heavier. Now I gotta set up some kind of a trick wire that will have a triggering system because I saw a fresh track out there that I don't like. And in this situation, you would want something to warn you that that predator was coming into your camp. This is what the natives call chicken guts. It's one of the strongest vines in the Pantanal. I want to make a paddle flapper, basically, a noise-making device that will flap up against something, just like you used to put cards in your bicycle spokes and hit the forks that went across. Blah, 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 blah. That's what I want. Dave's improvised tripwire requires vines strong enough to hold under tension and a simple noisemaker. This might be what I'm looking for. Nobody's gonna sleep real soundly in a situation like this anyway, so you just need something that's gonna make enough noise to wake you up. When the line is tripped, the vine uncoils, rattling the palm leaves. That would have done it right there, just about. But for it to work, the vine needs to hold extreme tension. If you can't get something set up like an early warning system to give you some kind of camp security that you can rely on, then you've got to stay awake all night. It's got to be tight. Time in the dangerous wild is always working against survival. With each passing day, an escape route becomes more urgent. What I'm doing now as the final burnout is to light a fire literally in each concavity that's been created with embers for the last several hours and give it a final burn. It's a rush to, to actually flip this canoe and see all of the stuff that fire can accomplish. It's really kind of, a, it blows your heart open. Your time spent on that boat is going to be greatly appreciated tomorrow. You know, there's no saying it's going to float just because it's a hollow log and we put some sides in the bottom stern on it. I think it'll float. I'm nervous about the gee whiz. Right. You know, does it float upside down? I'm more worried about how much water it takes on, right. you know, than I am at flipping over. Do we have it thin enough that it's not going to, with our weight, take on enough water to straight sink? Tomorrow's either a celebration or... Or become fish bait, one of the two. Coming up, the team's worst fears are realized. Oh, 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 But giving up isn't in Dave's game plan. I'm getting this canoe to float, come hell or high water, or I'm going to die in a sun. The most important survival strategy is a carefully planned escape. And in the Brazilian wetlands, Following a river is the best route to civilization. But spending days constructing a canoe is a gamble that could literally sink the mission. What do you think, man? I just want to keep checking some of these sides to see if I went too deep. I think it's pretty good, man. I think we got to put it in the water. I guess that's the ultimate test. 
There's a hell of a lot of work in something like this. And right now, it's a hope and a prayer because we don't even know if the damn thing's gonna float. So we bust on our asses. It's been done for thousands of years just like this. All we can do now is drag it down to the water and see how it works out. Here it is. Let's see how heavy this sucker is. Oh, <sighs> Two, 300 pounds. To properly function, the canoe will have to remain buoyant while carrying the weight of two 200-pound men. This is total piranha power here. Ooh. Real easy, because I don't want that front end to scoop. Keep going. I'm pushing down a little bit on just this. Just let it kind of float as it goes, man. Oh, oh, oh. Pull back just a little bit. OK. Just anchor that on the shore. Got it? Yep. That sucks. Can you feel the boat? <laughs> Is it still there? I'm standing in it. Well, not everything works the first time. Plan B. It makes a great set of underwater stairs. It's not a, not a total loss. Yeah, I failed with the boat. The bottom line is I made a giant decoration that couldn't even take my weight and instantly sank when I got into it. But the bigger disappointment is if I let it take my attitude down, because that kills people in a survival situation. You let your attitude get out of control, and you already are dead. The worst thing that could happen right now is for Cody or I to start pointing the finger and saying, I told you so. You have to work as a team. I got another plan. We flip the over. All the air pockets in here, and we just ride on top of them. If we take bundles of this wood that grows right here along the bank and put them on each side with outriggers tied and lashed to the bottom of the boat and make like a catamaran out of it. I think that's, that's the only option short of, of having a ceremonial Viking funeral pyre burning it and throwing it out there. All right, well, let's just get on that then okay. so we can get the hell out of here. OK. Lash five of these poles together, make it float better like a catamaran. So I just need to lash this in a few different places and make sure it'll stay together. I'm getting this canoe to float, come hell or high water, or I'm gonna die in this. Okay, round two. Round two. You got it, stable? Yeah, man. Ready? I'll give us a push. Yeah, man. Seem like it's gonna cut it? Yeah, we are. We're all right. In any emergency situation, you're going to have failures. It'll let your attitude go down because of little bumps in the road. I refuse to do that, you know, because that's what takes you down long term, not just in a survival situation, but life in general. Yeah, hey, what is that? Well, let's keep paddling. Yeah, let's get down there, man. Look up here in front of us, man. I see it. Looks like a ranch up here. It looks good to me. We're going there, huh? Yeah, I would say so. Another one down? Yeah. All right, man, let's get over there. OK. All right. Anything would be a hell of a lot better than this damn raft, I know that. 
In the military, you're taught you never give up until you just can't go on, period. We made it. That's what counts. Situation like this, that's the most important thing. Never, never give up.